Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! First, this seemed to catch everyone by surprise. Sir Bernard Hogan Howe announced he was standing down early as London's police chief, attracting commendations for good service from a range of public figures, starting at the very top. Well, I, of course, was the Home Secretary who appointed, uh, first appointed Bernard Hogan Howe as Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police. And I must say he's done an excellent job in his time and he's been uh, responsible for the policing of London at what has been a difficult time, given the level of terrorist threat that he's been dealing with. He came with an excellent record from Merseyside and I think he's done great work. He's built on that in London. His approach to total policing, I think, has been of real benefit to, uh, to Londoners. And I just wish him all the very best for the future. Plenty of uh, speculation, as you'd imagine, about why he's going right now. Why is he going? But I've worked with people right across different parties, different characters over the last 15 years, really, uh, as chairs of police authorities in Merseyside and mayors down here. And I've always got on really well, because the thing that you have to build is a trust, and the thing that you share as a common vision is you need to keep people safe. Sir Bernard uh, Hogan. How Keith Prince has uh, come in for this first section, Conservative Assembly member for, for Havering and, and Redbridge. Uh, welcome to you. As I suggested, there are a certain amount of kind of speculation about why he might have gone. He was due to go next September. He's going six months early, which feels like a kind of time of his choosing. Why do you think he's going early? Well, I think it's the relationship, isn't it? Clearly, he doesn't get on with Sadiq Khan. I think that's more of Sadiq's uh, making than it is of Sir Bernard's. Sir Bernard's done a great job in, in uh, the five years that he's been there, but uh, Sadiq wants his own man. It's very clear. Many a time in public, Sadiq's been critical, openly critical, of Sir Bernard. I think it's terrible, actually. Well, why, why is it very clear? On what? Well, we've asked questions of Sadiq in our meetings, and he is openly critical. He was critical about the issue around what people are calling spit hoods. He, uh, Just explain didn't... what those are, though, that, that were put over suspects to prevent them from spitting at officers, and Sir Bernard Hogan Howe had recommended a, a pilot scheme or introducing this and Sadiq Khan made it clear he didn't really like they were, that. They were going to be used in custody and they clearly protect officers. We've already had one officer who uh, had hepatitis C as a result of being spat at, so they were there to protect officers. And uh, as soon as Sadiq heard about this, he blocked it. So, you know, who does he care about? Does he care about his image or about our hard-working service? Are you saying that this is something new and what are you suggesting? That he's, he's actively involve, involving himself in operational matters? Well, without a question, absolutely. And, and that is crossing the line. He shouldn't be involving himself in operational matters and he is. You know, he wants to call the shots, he wants to dictate what's going on. Clearly Sir Bernard, being the gentleman that he is and being a professional, and also being a Yorkshireman, has his own views on how he thinks the police should be run and his record is exemplary. And uh, Mr Khan doesn't like it. Julia Sadiq, what do you think about this? I think actually uh, Keith has been quite unfair on Sadiq Khan. Uh, the hustings I attended, Sadiq was uh, talking about how good uh, Sir Bernard had been and how much work he had done, especially in policing the Olympics and also the 2011 riots. So I think that's unfair. Look, he's choosing to go. He's choosing to retire early. He has his own reasons for doing that. But we shouldn't talk about politics because Amber Rudd is going to have a say in selecting who the next person is and it also has to be someone who's reached that rank. You can't just pluck a figure out of the air and decide, right, he's going to have the most important job in policing. So it will be a combination of Sadiq Khan and Amber Rudd, who I may remind everyone is actually a Conservative and let's, let's politician. And let's not forget, Quasar you'll know the system. It is the Home Secretary that makes that decision right. after asking. Yeah, I mean, and, what, and, what's, and what's new about that? We know what happened in terms of you know, Boris Johnson and Theresa May with, um, with Sir Bernard's uh, appointment. Absolutely. I mean, I think there's no doubt that there's some po politics involved. I think you're quite right to say that there was some friction between Sadiq and uh, Sir Bernard. Is it worth pointing out here, though, that actually, sorry, just at this stage, that obviously Boris Johnson and his deputy, Stephen Greenhouse, weren't aware of this trial of, of, sp of, the, of the policy around spit hoods either, my understanding is. So, so you could argue that Sadiq Khan was just saying, we needed to have some public consultation on this before you introduce that. And there's a kind of narrow line about whether that's really operational. I think that Sadiq was being very political. He's a highly political mayor. He's got political skills. That's why he's, he is where he is. And I think he's taken a view, and Sir Bernard's taken a view that it's best for the both of them 
if um, Sir Bernard's, uh, you know, resignation, as it were, is accelerated. Do you have some sympathy for that? That that that, that actually he's had five very good years. A new mayor comes in with a new mandate. Do you think we shouldn't have a problem with a mayor thinking Look, I want someone a little bit more or new? I, anyway? I'm a realist about this. I'm a politician. I know what politicians are like when they come in. In any organisation, it's not just in politics. People want to get their own people around them because they feel comfortable with them. We've just had a reshuffle uh, earlier this year in government where lots of people uh, left the government. So it's completely inevitable that uh, a new leader will want a new team. I think this has been elegantly managed. But we can't pretend that everything, you know, they had a great working relationship when they, they clearly didn't. And if that was the case, uh, that they didn't particularly have a good, and there is a personal thing, he was going to be going next September anyway, it's a few months, gives everyone plenty of time to choose his successor. Well, but it doesn't though, does it, really? Um, where's the fire? The man was probably going to go in September anyway. That would have given the Mayor and the Home Secretary, and, and don't forget, it has to be go past the Queen as well, uh, time to look at candidates. Uh, we know there's no one actually outstanding that is a shoe in at the moment. It's going to take quite a few months to sort that out. By the time February comes, will we have someone in post or well, will London be without a commissioner? Keith Prince, thanks. Well, we could probably point out that, of course, you know, relatively speaking, here's someone going of his own choosing. Um, at least the transition won't be one you know, of crisis that we've had in the past. But um, thanks very much indeed for uh, coming in. Now, given the importance of international talent, foreign workers to London's economy, would it be possible post-Brexit for more flexible immigration arrangements in the rest of the country to apply here? Some like the idea of a London visa or work permit. Well, this week I tried to find out whether the Prime Minister might be contemplating anything like that. What we're doing in the preparations we're making before we trigger Article 50, but of course uh, those are preparatory for negotiations for Brexit, is listening to various sectors of the economy, listening to various parts of the, all parts of the country, the United Kingdom, to make sure that we understand the particular issues that are there that we need to take account of as we prepare for these negotiations. I want to make a success of Brexit. We're going to make a success of Brexit. We're going to make a success of the opportunities that will then be available to us when we leave the European Union as well. Would you contemplate looser immigration controls for the capital? Suggestions have been made uh, about work permits or visas that are separate for London to reflect that it has a slightly more liberal attitude to immigration. Well, one of the clear messages that came from the vote on the 23rd of June was that people wanted to see us controlling uh, movement from the European Union into the United Kingdom. But of course, we're talking to all parts of, of the country about, and all businesses across all parts of the country, and that includes the City of London, about the needs that they would have in relation to uh, the negotiations for Brexit and what they hope when we've left the European Union. But are you, do you accept that your perceived brand of toughness on, on immigration is, 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 is something that could potentially damage the economy of London? That's what people are saying. Well, the, the response I'm giving in relation to immigration is based on the views of the British people. People voted uh, to leave the European Union. They wanted to see control. They wanted to see their government able to control movement of people from the EU into the UK. And we will deliver on that. Quasi, how does she manage that? How would you manage that? That if, if there is a difference in London, which people say there is, how are you yeah. going to deal with that? I don't see why London should get a special status. I mean, the, the whole point about controlling freedom of movement is that we want to stop people, as it were, coming on spec. If you've got a job, then you'll be able to come, I, I imagine. And so there's no reason, I think, if that operates, why London should be treated differently from the rest of the country. It's not an independent country. It's not a city-state on its own. Tulip, what do you think here? Do you think there should be some sort of this... I don't know whether you've had time to think about this kind of concept of a London visa or work permit or how it could work. There are regionalised examples of regionalised systems, like Canada, for instance, where it does work. Look, I do think London is a special case in terms of the number of people who live here and the number of people who want to live here. But I think what I worry about listening to Theresa May is that the EU referendum was not a proxy vote on immigration, which is what it sounds like. For me, we do need to talk about the benefits of immigration and how much money European migrants have actually bought to our economy. Between, 2000, between 10 years, in the last 10 years, it's been £20 billion pounds that they've contributed. And we need to talk about that. I do agree that we need to have some system where we monitor how many people are in the country, how many people leave, but let's not forget the benefits of immigration and let's not make it a proxy vote on immigration, which is what it seems to have happened. But nobody is doubting. I mean, we're both um, 
uh, I mean, everyone's a son or daughter of an immigrant at some uh, point in their history. But, you know, there are lots of recent arrivals who've made a huge impact. There's no question about that. The issue that has always been the case is one of control, controlled immigration. And under the EU rules, you've got this issue of free movement, which millions of people around the country have an issue with, because you've, you, you're essentially saying we're going to import 150,000 people every single year mm. till kingdom come. And that wasn't acceptable. And I think the vote, there were lots of things that drove people to vote as they did in June in the Brexit vote. But I think a lot of it was to do with, with being able to control uh, migration from the EU. Um, wasn't it folly, um, Tulip, for your leader to say, not really hung up by, with numbers, I'm not going to impose any kind of limit? In other words, it was read as, we can have unlimited immigration. Look, what I would say is, certainly in my constituency, immigration enriches the community that we live in. In terms of the number of people, we've already seen that putting an arbitrary figure on how many people can come into the country and saying, yes, we're going to cap immigration at this point, has not worked for Theresa May, has not worked for the Conservatives. So I don't think you can actually put an arbitrary mm. figure or a cap on it, because they certainly didn't meet that figure. But you but you can indicate about... an absolute direction of travel and a, and a declaration of intent. I think the intent is to monitor how many people come in. But don't forget about the thousands of British people who live outside and who live in Europe. What are we going to do about them? Are they all going to come back in now? I think you have to have an overall picture before you make a decision on what we do about immigrants. Are you assuming that there will be no, we won't pursue, Theresa May, your government will not go down a kind of region life, will not go down... I don't think, I think that's, I mean, I don't, I'm not sure how it works in Canada. I mean, practicality, I, probably, is it? I, I haven't really thought about how you would in, implement it in, in reality, having a London-only uh, uh, permit. I mean, would that prevent you from going to Watford or, or Oxford or wherever it might be to work? I don't know how that would, that would work in practice. What I would say about Jeremy Cor Corbyn is, and I'm going to say a nice thing about him, actually, you know, he's honest. He's a, he, he honestly believes that, you know, we shouldn't really be looking at targets. Um, he's someone who uh, represents Islington, very multicultural community, and he's clearly very happy with, with, with not having a cap on immigration. His problem is that a large section of his base in the, in the Labour Party and also Labour MPs do feel that there should be some, some restriction or some um, degree of, of, of oversight in terms of how many people come in, and they think that's an issue in their communities. That's quite nice. You take that, bank that quickly. Well, that, I mean, you know, it doesn't get said very often, so, yeah, I would definitely report back to Jeremy. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's move on. Are we in a position to define what Theresa May's conservatism will feel like in London yet? Is it goodbye to Notting Hill? And hello, Sidcup. Yes, according to this report by Andrew Crime. Notting Hill, a place where a little over ten years ago, a group of young, ambitious Tories are said to have planned a takeover of their party and then the country. David Cameron, George Osborne and Michael Gove and their friends were called the Notting Hill set, a phrase coined by the journalist Peter Oborn. He told us a bit about the neighbourhood. You may not be very close uh, to the English working class, but by, you're really close to the hedge fund managers. Hedge fund managers sprout all over here. So, how might all of this inform the way you saw the world? Immigration is only a good thing if you live in Notting Hill because you have your expensive house. Uh, and your English, surly English plumber is undercut by the go-ahead Polish plumber. So you like immigration. Uh, if you're a shareholder, you're the company you have shares in, uh, the, the price of labour has been driven down by mass immigration, and that's terrific because it means more profits for you. And so you take a benign view of immigration, and it only impacts on you personally uh, as a good thing. So could it be that Notting Hill was part of David Cameron's downfall? It's not perhaps as ridiculous as it immediately sounds, because if the vote to leave the EU really was, as some people think, a rebellion against a metropolitan, wealthy, liberal elite, the idea that the most powerful people in the country were happiest around here in a bistro somewhere, well, it can hardly have helped. Just hours into the job of Prime Minister, Theresa May wasted no time in telling the nation that she wasn't trapped in an elitist bubble. I know that sometimes life can be a struggle, the government I lead will be driven not by the interests of the privileged few, but by yours. So, how is Theresa May going down in places like Sidcup on London's Kentish border, where £400,000 still buys you a house and not a car parking space? There's even a grammar school around the corner. Do you think she's more likeable than David Cameron? Um, 
Um, it's not. hard to say at the moment. But yeah. yeah, I think she probably is. Well, let's give her a chance. I personally don't think so. But to be fair, we've got to give her a chance. I think she's got God in her life. And I think, you know, that will help her tremendously. I don't know too much about her just yet. So yeah. it's not fair for me to say anything about her until I know more about her myself. And for all those locals looking for a steer on what the new Prime Minister is like, could do worse than ask their local MP. After all, he worked with Theresa May for five years at the Home Office as a minister. And his name is James Brokenshire. Whether it's in Bexley where I am, to Bethnal Green and Bow, or maybe out into Barnet, it is that message of opportunity, of allowing people to get on with their lives, get a good school, get a good job, ensure that they are seeing a real positive opportunity from wherever they come from. Conservatives say that their conference this week is going to flesh out who Theresa May is. We asked the new Housing Minister Gavin Barwell for a tip-off. He told us one thing to look out for was recognition not just of people wanting to buy a home, but renters too. There's a lot of people in London that rent as well, and we need to have a, a policy that's balanced, that seeks to try and improve their housing conditions. So I want more people building homes for people to own. I want more people building homes for rent in the private sector and more affordable uh, rented homes as well. London is also going to get a new devolution package and a decision on Heathrow's third runway any week now. All will be spun as being decisions made for ordinary people. But at least at the moment, what's missing from all of this is one key thing. What the Prime Minister is actually going to do about leaving the European Union and immigration. We've already talked about that, so let's talk about this. Tulip, from your point of view, what do you see as a kind of change of style here? Uh, is it more dangerous to you in Labour than the, the previous one? Well, look, I don't think she's been in the job that long, but from what I can see, I am worried. Uh, don't forget, this is the lady who signed off the go home vans if we're talking about immigration, which caused huge discontent in my community and within Hampstead and Kilburn generally, which is very are you, are you worried about her, I should have clarified, as an electoral strength weakening your own position? Labour's? No, actually, do you know what I am worried about? I'm worried about the fact that she said Brexit is Brexit, but then actually not elaborated on what it means. It feels like she's the only person in the world who knows what Brexit means. I'd like to know more about that. But what's really worried me in the last few weeks, and I'm sure you're aware of this, is this hark back to grammar schools. You can't sit on the steps of Downing Street and talk about not working for a privileged few and then talk about bringing back grammar schools. That has worried me tremendously. And if I were a normal voter, that would probably strike fear in my heart. Change of style? What, what do you see in these early days? Um, I think it's a different style. I think she has a more, um, a less kind of gilded, if you like, uh, uh, sort of sheen about her. I think she's very uh, down to earth. And you've got to remember, she was a, a, a councillor, a Conservative councillor in Wimbledon for 10 years, I think. I mean, she's someone who knows the party. She's come from the grassroots. Uh, she's the daughter of a vicar. She herself went to a grammar school. Do you school. think there's this very kind of, there will be this kind of cultural, this thing from Notting Hill to the kind of suburbs, Spellthorn to Sidcup? Absolutely. I mean, I think somewhere, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, I'm not uh, trying to uh, denigrate David Cameron. I think he did great things. But I think uh, people in my constituency will relate to someone like Theresa May um, as much, if not more, than they did to, to David Cameron. And what about the speed of like reviewing? Well, we've heard about grammar schools from Tulip, but we've heard suggestions on housing. Do you think like breaking with David Cameron's legacy as fast as you might have expected? No, I think she's evolving. Um, you know, parties evolve. That's why the Conservative Party is a successful party. Parties evolve. They have different messages. They have different styles. Evolution. And I think, right, I, think, yeah. I, think we're, I think we're I think we're evolving. I think we have a, as a new leadership. I think they're really interesting ideas. I happen to support grammar schools. I think they're a good they're a good thing and it seems odd to me that lots of the people who are against them tend to go to selective schools or send their children to selective schools. What about the clear, Fergus, there is a, a, a clear signal uh, being sent about shifting away from a lot of the resources and attention that have gone into home ownership that renting perhaps has been neglected. Would you go with that? I think that's, I think that's a, absolutely right, especially in a place like Spelthorne, or just, which is just outside London and within London itself. Um, you know, it costs sometimes £400,000, as you said, to buy even a flat sometimes. And so people feel that renting is, is, is something which is more affordable and realistic. That's an interesting signal if they are moving to address issues around rent, which they acknowledge they have not been doing. That's important for Londoners. Absolutely. You I mean, should share that and agree with that shift in policy if that is what it is for the Conservatives. Look, I support policies if they benefit constituents who live around me and live in London. So in the last manifesto, the Conservative Party didn't mention anything about private renting, which was a glaring omission. So if they are looking to address it, it's very important because 
more and more people are renting and we need to protect a lot of people who are renting from what goes on with private landlords but also the cost of renting and Jeremy Corbyn already mentioned it in his speech we've got to have some form of rent control if we want people to have somewhere to live and what about would you see some people are saying that maybe a measure we need is this kind of you know the stamp duty holiday or the or to reverse some of the restrictions that were being put on people renting out properties yeah I tended to um, be slightly skeptical about those sorts of policies because or if you're posing um, taxes essentially on people who are wanting to enter the private uh, rental market as landlords you're just going to reduce the supply of, of those properties which will drive up the price of rents so I was always slightly skeptical about that sort of thing we'll have to review it but I think what Tulip said is right I think we've got to be realistic about the housing need in London and, and the provision and renting is an important increasingly important part of that mix okay let's move on uh, now for the rest of the political news in 60 seconds At the Labour Party conference in Liverpool, Sadiq Khan set out his vision for Labour in emphatic terms. It was all about winning back... Power. With Labour in power, power in power, back in power, power. Thank you. A word he used 38 times. He mentioned his leader just the once. Prior to the conference, it is alleged that the London Mayor and Labour's party leader had not spoken for three months. And we Nevertheless, when Jeremy Corbyn delivered his keynote speech to the party faithful, he included a positive name check for the mayor. In the May elections, we overtook the Tories to become the largest party nationally. We won back London with a massive win for Sadiq Khan, the first Muslim mayor of a western capital city. My congratulations... Sadiq, Sadiq Khan's reaction was, well... Um, Enigmatic? Kazi Shoshia. Shoshia best Well, it was very think? entertaining. I mean, how many times... Very Power Ranger. How many times did he mention it? 38 times? 38. I mean, he's clearly on a high. He's just become Mayor of London. He wants power. He's. I think he wants Jeremy's job at some point. You should point. be scared, very scared. Um, for that. I'm not scared of him, no. I mean, I think he's, he's very driven by power and he's a successful politician. I think he's eminently beatable, certainly in the country. But he's someone... I, if I were Jeremy, I'd be very worried. I mean, not to mention him once and to well, talk about power. I mentioned him once, sorry. Congratulations. Uh, and, Chile, is he, yeah, go on. and to talk about power for what, 38 times? Yeah. Sorry, did you say he was beatable? Because Absolutely. I'm pretty sure he beat your candidate well, quite badly. Is it a slight problem? The, the time you got left, 30 seconds, a slight problem when you've got mayor and leader. Mayor so obviously almost wanting to distance himself from, from his leader. I think that's being too harsh on him. He wants you know, Sadiq, on Sadiq Khan. So, uh, on both of them. I mean, you know, they work so together. You think it's being harsh, Sadiq Khan being harsh on Jeremy Corbyn? No, no, I think it's you're being harsh on John Sadiq. He was being humble. He didn't want to smile and applaud when he was being Sadiq mentioned. Sadiq clearly so. wants... But do you think this is going to be, in ten seconds, do you think this is going to become a bit of a narrative now? People can constantly see him as the leader across the water. I think uh, Sadiq's just got the job of Mayor of London and he's going to do a much better job than Boris Johnson ever did. I've been